Hello, my wonderful people. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, depending on your time zone or any time you are coming across my platform. If it is your first time and you like what I'm doing in this platform, after watching, kindly subscribe, put on your notification bell to all notifications. In that way, you'll be able to know when we upload a new video. YouTube, I want to appreciate you for creating this platform for us to use to disseminate information. And I also want to put a disclaimer to all the content in Linda's TV show that we do not promote hate speech, violence, or misleading information. Linda's TV show is here to inform, educate the members of the public. We do not instigate war. I don't like war. I don't like violence. I don't like misleading information. So you will never see me promoting those things here. Please take note. Ladies and gentlemen of the media, and welcome to this very crucial press briefing by the legal team of Mazi Namde Kano. My name is Aloy Ijmako. I am Namde Kano's special counsel. And by the grace of God, I currently double as his lead counsel. On my right is Barrister Jude. Uguay of the legal committee, I'm sorry, of the legal team. On my left is Barrister Mandela Umeboorog. He has been in the trenches defending Mazin Namdekano since 2016. And on my extreme right is Barrister Ikenna, who also is a member of the legal team. The purpose of this press briefing is very simple and straight to the point. We felt it has become necessary to brief the members of the media on certain salient, certain very important developments in the case of Mazin Namdekano. Me being the first speaker, I'll briefly touch on the history of this case and I'll turn over the mic to my colleague here to take the other segment of this briefing. You will all recall that this case started in 2015, sometime in October, when Mazin Namdekan was arrested in Lagos on, a, on his arrival from the United Kingdom. Then he was charged with four or five offenses, mostly bordering on treasonable felony. One was treasonable felony by itself. The other one was conspiracy to commit treasonable felony. There was also a charge that bordered on defamation of the then president and one that bordered on false declaration of an imported radio equipment. The case initially made its way to the magistrate court in Abuja, where in December 2016, the DSS, which had brought the case forward, filed a nolle prosecute. They filed an application before the magistrate court to discontinue his prosecution in the magistrate court on the premise that they were moving over to the high court. And that was granted. Thereupon, the case moved over to the high court, and it was in the high court. And during that period, between 2016 and 2017, Mazin Nandekan was granted bail twice. The order for bail was not complied with by the federal government. And one of the judges, Justice Adeniyi, who granted him bail unconditionally, became a casualty of the federal government. It's in the public domain. It was widely published then in accordance or quoting the judge himself, that part of the reason he was arrested subsequently and tried in court was because he had granted unconditional bail to Mazen Nandekan. Anyway, in the very end, sometime in April of 2017, he was finally granted the latest bail then by Justice Binta Moritela Nyako. That was the bail that he perfected and which the federal government obeyed. So he returned to his ancestral home in Omaha, awaiting his next court date, which was in October of 2017. 
But lo and behold, between the 10th of October and 14th of October, the Nigerian army started or commenced little military invasion attacks at his ancestral home in Oma. Several people were killed. Mazin and the Kano's parents were both alive, but they suffered injuries to which they later succumbed to and died one week apart. Nandi Kano himself, in order to save himself, save his life, had to flee from the location and fortunately for him he found his way overseas and he remained in exile until June of 2021 when he was encountered in Kenya by Nigerian security agencies who have been on a manhunt for him. They laid ambush for him at the Jobo Kenyatta International Airport and they abducted him at the parking lot of the Jobo Kenyatta International Airport where he had gone on a personal error. From then, he was disappeared for eight days at a secret location in Kenya, not a law enforcement location, facility. He was disappeared and during those eight days, he endured horrendous physical and mental torture. Eventually, on the eighth day, they brought him out from that location and secretly took him to the tarmac, straight to the tarmac, evading immigration. Kenyan immigration, put him on a private jet and renditioned him to Nigeria. He wasn't extradited. Most of these things are in the public domain. I'm doing this to, just to recap so that the public and the media in particular will be aware of how this case is now turning from prosecution to persecution. After he was brought into the country, the federal government instead of pivoting on the charges for which Mazin Nandekano was so unlawfully and forcibly brought into the country, totally abandoned those charges, all of them. But for one, the one that bordered on false declaration of an imported radio equipment. That's a very unserious charge. The more serious ones bordering on treasonable offenses were completely abandoned in place of new ones. 15 of them bordering on terrorism. What this means is that for a whole seven years, between 2015 and 2017, 2022, when these charges were finally amended to 15 and the old ones abandoned, the charges I will characterize as pre rendition charges were completely abandoned. Mazin Namdekano suffered at the hands of the criminal justice system in Nigeria for seven whole years, between 2015 and 2022, for charges that were later abandoned. So for the 18 months he was detained, subsequent to his arrest in 2015, he was detained for nothing. He, deserve, he didn't deserve one day of that detention. He also didn't deserve any tribulation and travails that he had to go through for these seven years, including the Python dance nearly claimed his life, but claimed the life of his parents and other innocent people, including his exile abroad and including his rendition. So you may ask, why was he renditioned for charges that were later to be abandoned? That's a question for that the answer will come one day sooner than later. Now, you all are aware of what happened in the High Court. The High Court, um, in response to objections filed against his trial, struck out eight of the charges, leaving seven in place, which went to the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal proceeded to strike all of the charges due to the extraordinary rendition which the Court of Appeal held had divested Nigerian courts of jurisdiction to try it. So he was discharged and was supposed to go home pursuant to that order of discharge. But the federal government did not obey that order. For a whole two weeks, he was looking for a way to dodge it and finally he found a way by filing an application for stay of execution of the order. And the application was granted in a, speed, in a swift way that really would shock 
everybody in this country that knows that matters like that are often very much delayed in court. But I'll leave that aside. Eventually, the case proceeded to the Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court held that they must stand trial. In other words, the Supreme Court reversed the judgment of the Court of Appeal, but the Supreme Court also made other rulings that the revocation of his bail was wrong, the warrant of arrest upon which his, his rendition from Kenya was granted was wrong, that manifest misrepresentations were made to the High Court by the federal government that he had joined bail, and the High Court was misled, and otherwise did not pay too much attention to the explanations as to why Mazem Nandikano was not available to take his trial. And thereby, the trial court proceeded to issue that questionable warrant of arrest that led to his rendition. Now, the case has been remitted back to the trial court, the high court, and we're here, the legal team, battling to defend him the best way we could. We have done a bail application, a fresh bail application, which was denied. We raised objections to his trial due to the fact that we are not able as a team and individually as lawyers, when we visit him at the detention facility at the state security services in Abuja, we are not able to consult with him properly. He deserves his right to counsel, unfettered right to counsel, unburdened by interference of government officials. He also deserves to have the adequate facilities to defend himself. These two things are denied him and they are constitutional rights found under section 36, sub 6, B and C of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Every one of us enjoys such a right. It's called right to fair hearing. I don't see why Mazen Nandekano should be an exception. But lo and behold, the High Court, in its wisdom, denied our objection and ordered for an accelerated hearing. So that's where we are now. We have the matter scheduled for hearing on the 17th of April. And before then, we decided we have to bring some other applications. So right now, we have one application pending, which is to restore his bail. The application is different in so many different degrees from an application for bail. While one was an application for a new bail, the other is an application, or the current one is an application to restore his bail under the conditions that it was previously granted. The application is pending. But then, on a final note, when this matter started in 2015 and escalated to September 2017 with Python dance and all that, Mazen Namdekan, through myself, brought an application before the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, complaining about the Python dance and proscription of IPOB, and he won. The African Commission, which is a branch of the African Union, wrote a letter to the then president calling for implementation of certain things they asked him to do. One of them being that he should, he should henceforth or thenceforth cease and desist from further prosecutions or law enforcement actions against IPOB members and in particular Mazem Nandekano. That decision was ignored. The United Nations intervened in 2020 and 2021 with similar decisions. Those two were also ignored. After his rendition, the United Nations intervened again in July 2021 and issued a celebrated opinion that he should be released unconditionally. That too was ignored. Now, a high court, a federal high court sitting in Omaha in October 2022 issued a decision condemning his detention, declaring it illegal and non-constitutional, his current detention in Abuja. That too was ignored. Back in January 2022, a high court of the state of Abia had awarded him one billion naira as compensation for the, for the, for the damages he suffered 
or that issued from that infamous Python dance. Payment of that compensation is outstanding. So also is the apology to him that the court had ordered. And then finally, last year in October, a high court in Enugu State declared that the executive or administrative actions taken by the Southeast governors and the federal government back in 2017 to proscribe IPOV and declare it a terrorist organization, those actions were unconstitutional under Section 42 of the Constitution. This is important because Nigerians, all Nigerians, are supposed to be treated equally. What had happened to IPOB in 2017 in terms of the proscription was a stark evidence of discrimination, which is unconstitutional under Section 42 of the Constitution. We have been saying that until last year in October when a high court agreed that that is so. We had figured that in an enlightened society such as ours, which is subject to rule of law, the federal government would have taken steps pursuant to that judgment of October last year to file some sort of application to withdraw the proscription of IPOB as it is and to cancel the terrorist toga that is placed on IPOB. Why? Because that very proscription in 2017, being experted, did not give opportunity to IPOB or any of its members to make representations as to why it should not be proscribed or as to why it should not be declared a terrorist organization. That offends Section 36 of the Constitution, which requires that any law that derogates from the right of any Nigerian, his right to fair hearing, should have given him an opportunity to make representations. So these are the several violations. And unfortunately, these violations have led to incalculable damage to citizens of this country, to innocent people, mostly in the South East and South South. Hundreds have been killed in pursuit or in law enforcement actions related to fighting IPOB. It's wrong to do all that on a mere expert order. Thousands are languishing in detention, and of course you know Nam Dekano himself is also languishing in detention following his rendition. So too many bad things have happened, and we're hoping that we'll come full circle to a point where people will sit back government officials, the federal government, led by President Ahmed Tinibu, to look again at this case and to see whether this case has any merit at all, or whether the case was, as it were, politically motivated, to the point that the present administration should not have any business inheriting it. When someone says, I do not want to be belong to a country anymore, you don't lock him, you don't pursue him with bullets and manacles and all kinds of things to put him in jail or to prosecute him. You try to talk to him. That, I think, is the more sensible thing to do than this law enforcement that is not going to be the solution to it. Thank you. My colleague now. Yes, my... What is too long about that? My name is Jude Ogwai. I'm a member of the legal team for Namdekano. The area I want to agitate is the, the manner the prosecution is being handled. We are ready to defend Mazin Namdekano. The offenses for which he's standing trial are not such that there is no defense. We have strong defenses. But our our fear is the way and manner we are being denied access to him. As lawyers, we are entitled to meeting with our client, Mazen Namdekano, liaising with him, discussing and hearing from him what defenses he has against those charges. 
But each time we make effort towards seeing him, we are restrained by the DSS. I'm a victim. The allegations against Mazen Namdekano are personal allegations against him. He's the only person that can tell his lawyers what he did and what he did not do, and what line of defenses he could rely on. And that is why section 36 of section 6, paragraph G, paragraph C, says that as an accused person, he's entitled to a lawyer of his choice. Now, in an attempt to utilize that opportunity, we go to him to hear from him, get his line of defenses, because we are not there when these allegations were made. We are not there when he said to have committed these offenses. He's the only one that can tell us what defenses he has. But we are restrained. We are not allowed to lie with him. If we go with documents, for him to tell us his reactions to those documents, those documents are seized from us, they are scanned, they are photocopied. In the long run, we may not even get those documents back. Now, if we say, okay, Please, Mazen Namkano, charge number so and so says this is what you did. What is your reaction to it? We are not even allowed to take those documents to him. Those documents are seized from us. And if we want to take note, they say this is the limited number of pages you can write from what he's telling you. These things affect the facilities the Constitution says he's entitled to. That is the provision of Section Taxes, Subsection 6, Paragraph D of the Constitution. That is our fear. It's not that we can, we are not, we are disposed to accelerated hearing. We will in the wrong, long run succeed. But where we are not allowed access to him, or even the little access we are allowed, we are not allowed to get information from him, get documents from him, get him signed documents for change of cancer. We are constrained to say that this is not how it is done elsewhere. And we are two parties and contesting over a case in a, a court of law. And there is no equality. There is discrimination. Somebody has upper hand and is being allowed. I doubt if that prosecution or whatever we call it is the best as done in, a, in any other country. That is what we think is wrong. And if they allow us access as required by law, we will come here and celebrate with you when the man will be discharged, acquitted and compensated. Thank you. I'm limiting it. My colleague wanted to say something. I said no. That we don't have enough time. No, what we are saying is that we, he, he was speaking from experience. He even cited himself as an example. There was a day he went to see him. They wouldn't allow him to see him. That was about three or four weeks ago. So that exemplifies what we passed through. And we, we, when we go in there, what, they, they, we can't see him as a group of lawyers. They separate us. I see him for 30 minutes and they rush me. I go out, he sees him. They rush him out, you see. So there is no cohesion that is required to defend such uh, very grievous offenses or allegations. So those are the things we are battling with here. And we have concern about the privacy of our conversations. Where there was a day I was consulting with him with another colleague, and they took a secret photograph of myself. They accidentally filed that photograph as part of their proof of proof of evidence in court. So we now got it as an evidence and we said, wow. So they were taking secret photographs of us. And if you go into the room, you will not see any camera. So evidently you have hidden eyes, hidden cameras and everything. So what and what not. So what else do they have? If if dropping equipment, secret listening devices or what? So we whisper in fear. And sometimes you just have to pull, pull him out to say something or even pull yourself out to say something because you're ever afraid someone is somewhere secretly recording you. How can we conduct an effective defense under these conditions? It's not possible. That's for objecting to the trial. Well, yeah, we did. It was one of the companion applications we filed, along with the application for reconsideration of revocation of his bail. Spending. That application was requested by the court itself. We made an oral application, and the court didn't deny, and he said, this is a court of record, 
go and put it in writing, and we did it as the court directed. Yes, let me ask that. Sir, with all the challenges you face, the fair trial. Okay, whether we are confident that you get a fair trial, yes. the confidence is zero. Under present circumstances, our confidence is zero, nada. My colleague said it here. There's no way Mazen Namdekano can get fair trial under the current conditions of his detention, which encourage the profound interference with his access to counsel and the adequate facility to conduct his defense that we initiated earlier on. There's no, not going to be any fair trial in that kind of scenario. Impossible. <laughs> um, the drafters of the laws of Federation of Nigeria are wise. There is a section in the Federal High Court Act, you can check it out, section 17 of the Federal High Court Act empowers Federal High Court judges to recommend reconciliation, otherwise known as political solution, in this very circumstance between combatants, between the prosecution and the defense. And it did not limit it to civil cases only. It includes uh, criminal cases. And we are human beings. We are, we are imbued with the capacity to talk, to negotiate, to compromise certain things, to do give and take. So anybody that puts that issue on the table, it will be considered the issue of political solution. I alluded to it earlier on. The agitation itself is political. So it fits into the mode of the agitation. Political solution makes better sense than law enforcement. Would I suggest it? Yes. Well, I'm saying I'm a lawyer. I'm transactional. It's for the government to put it on the table that, listen, you are agitating for something, and that's why we're holding you. Can we talk? Then we consider it. I, we are not going to reject it flat out. It will be. It will not make sense. Political solution is always possible. I don't think it, it makes sense to reject it, regardless of where it's coming from. Well, it will be our duty first is to defend them, not to play politics, not to recommend political solutions like what my colleague called line of defenses. That's what we are struggling with. Right now, what is on the table is we are fighting to make sure he gets fair trial. So we are not fighting to get a political solution. That's not our brief. But if it falls into our hands and our client instructs us to consider it, we will carry out the instruction of our client. So we haven't come to that bridge. When we come to it, we shall cross it. Thank you. What are they? the chances of your client getting freedom free under Tunubu's government? Well, uh, I've, I've said it uh, initially when I was speaking. I wondered whether this is an inherited headache for the current president. This is an issue that began from the last administration. We don't know to which extent it was considered a personal spat between the previous president and Mazen Namekan and the policies of that previous president, which are not necessarily the policies of uh, uh, President Ahmed Tinibu. So we are optimistic. I was in court the other day, and we were arguing an application, the application for his bail, and the judge wondered whether, the, you know, if he's granted bail, whether he's going to honor the conditions of his bail. And I used this metaphor to answer the judge. And I said, well, he will, because he was Buhari and his army that chased him out of Nigeria. And I don't think Tinibu and his army will chase him out of Nigeria again. So people laughed, but I think it captured the sense that we expect this administration to handle this matter a bit more differently than the, or from the way the previous administration hand, had handled it. And we have precedents to point to. Uh, under this administration, we have seen Sondo Iboho walk free. It was the previous administration that, 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 that pursued him into being in the Republic. 
he returned in peace, a free man, expressing himself, waxing, swaggering all over the place, a free citizen, under Tinubu, and we also have a high profile case of Yele Shore, who whose case was no late. That's what lawyers call it. That is the Attorney General discontinued his prosecution. The man was literally imprisoned in Nigeria for five years. He couldn't travel because he had his passport. Now his case has been continued by the Attorney General and he returned to the US. He's a free man today. So sometimes you do wonder what makes the case of Mazin Mandekan unique. And we do not want to succumb to certain sentiments. But people are beginning to ask questions as to whether where he heard from is part of the problem that is confronting him. Thank you. Video together with me from the beginning to the end. Like I said before, if you like what you see here, if you like what I do in this platform, as you have finished watching this video, please hit that red button that says subscribe and put on your notification bell to all notifications. In that way, you'll be able to know when I upload a new video. Share my videos, leave your comments in the comment section constructively. Until I meet your way again in my next video, I still remain your Linda's TV show. Bye-bye.